Welcome back to the shop. I have here a 2024 CRF 450 Works Edition. All right, what we're going to be doing on this bike today is pulling out these springs. By the way, this is a brand new bike. It doesn't have, but I don't even know. It's probably been started up, but it hasn't been ridden. Anyway, we're pulling out the stock springs and we're going to be putting in the Honda OEM stiffer springs. There are just two sizes uh, stiffer on the forks and two sizes stiffer on the shock. But that's what we're going to be doing. All the steps in this video can be followed on the CRF 450R and the CRF 250R from 2017 or so to the current model. Um, to be quite honest with you, the part of just changing out the shock spring and the fork springs will be the same dating all the way back to maybe early 2000s or before. But as far as getting the rear shock out of the, out of the, off the bike, that's going to be relatively the same from 2017 and up with minor differences here and there. They kind of moved the battery from up here to down there and stuff like that. But you'll figure it out as you go along. It's going to be about the same thing. All right, let's dig in. Well, how about before I actually start sticking a tool in this thing, let's take a second and look at this beauty. She is brand spanking new. Of course, he's put some decals on it. And uh, he put, I believe he put this exhaust system on it. She is definitely a pretty bike. Has a nice Henson cover. Ask Ricky Carmichael about these pegs. Uh, yeah, she's a pretty bike. It's my friend Offney's bike. Brand new bike. He's already put some grips on it and everything. Okay, there's, let's start with the shock. Um, there are two ways to pull the shock off the bike. We can go the bottom way by removing the swing arm. The rear wheel, the swing arm, and all that, and pull the shock out the bottom, or we can go out the top. Um, I was originally going to go the bottom route, but the owner told me that he finds it pretty easy to get it out the top, so I'm just going to shoot for that. So I guess the first thing I'm going to have to do is pull the seat and pull the muffler off. Okay, <clears throat> next step is going to be loosening up the subframe. Let me take this clip off the gas tank here. Get that off. Alright, let me go ahead and take the bolts out for the subframe. And as I say in all my videos, you will see me use an end pack deer and tear down, however, deer and reassembly. I'm real cautious of where I use an end pack because you can strip stuff out in a hurry. Well, to be able to get the uh, the clamp off for the uh, where the boot connects to the throttle body here, I will have to lift up the tank to be able to loosen that up. And they have these safety straps here, so I'm just going to slide that off. There we go. I'll show you what that looks like once I have the tank up. I should be able to lift it up now, no problem. Oh, I still have to take that off and loosen up that bolt. Let me do that. There we go. Okay, let me lift the tank up now. Be careful, there are electrical wires. That's why they have that safety strap. You can let me see if it's on camera here. Yeah, you can see this little tab right here. It has this cable or this uh, ribbon right here that hooks up to this. And you need to disconnect that first before you can lift the tank up. But now I can get up in here and loosen up that Phillips right there to loosen up this clamp. That way we can slide this whole subframe up off the throttle body and get it out of our way. There we go. 
you want to get that pretty loose, pretty much as loose as you can get it. Alright. Now I'll just for the time being just set the tank back up in place here. There we go. I'm gonna I'm gonna carefully attempt to slide try to slide this subframe up off. But be careful because there's still wires connected and such. Let me get something to pry on the uh, on the boot where it meets, meets the throttle body. There we go. Again, you want to be careful. There's sensors all around there. You don't want to pry anything you're going to break. And uh, don't just yank the subframe up. There are wires that will still be connected to it. I see that I need to disconnect the vent. Let me pull the tank back up disconnect the vent that goes from the air box to the top of the throttle I mean to the top of the uh, motor the valve cover okay let's give it another shot if you can't tell I haven't gone this route on this particular model yet I've done it on the previous Honda 450 but not on this one so this is the first time for me so I'm taking my time because I don't want to damage anything I'm gonna loosen that up right here I'm gonna just dis just pinch these together. There we go. All right. There's one more right here, but I might be able to leave that connect. There's a sensor over here. I'm gonna disconnect that sensor for the air box coolant temperature sensor. I believe that's it, guys. I'm gonna leave that hanging there real gently take you over here you don't want to bump this while it's off while it's hanging like this if you have kids around or anything just uh lock them up for the time being yes so now we should be able to get that shock right up out of there let me cover that with something i don't need anything falling in there while we're doing this job there you go special tool number 954 you can pick these up on my online store all right 17 millimeter I got on there pretty tight. Got her. I'll take the one off the bottom too. Oh, that one's going to take a wrench. Oh, wait. I lied. I could fit a socket on it. All right. Yes. Okie dokie. Let me go ahead and lift up on the back wheel just a little bit and slide that bolt out of there. Uh, let me get myself positioned better here. Just let that hang. Let's go back up top now. Go ahead and pull this one all out. Hey, shout out to all my subscribers out there. I appreciate every single one of you guys. I appreciate you coming along in this journey with me. I hope this is um, informative and also entertaining. Uh-oh. Well, let's slide it out. Okay, grab the subframe again because it kind of starting to fall down a little bit. And grab the shock and just careful it on out. I'm just going to set the subframe kind of right here gently. I think that'll work. Okay, this is pretty much the easy part of the job. Okay. Sorry about Beavis. Anytime he hears me talk, he's got to make noise too. I, I put a little bit of WD-40 on these threads here. It just kind of helps. That helps it spin a little freer. Break out the punch. Oh, 
trying really easy not to mark anything on this nice new bike. It's brand new. When I hand it back to him, I want it to still look new. You know how new bikes are. You try to keep them new as long as you can. Enjoy that fresh feeling. Nothing stays new forever. And they are meant to be ridden. And they're meant to be worn out. But when they're new, it's nice. All right, got that loose. Now, the reason we have chosen to go with the OEM manufacturer springs but they're they're um they're optional stiffer springs i'm going to use this tool right here if you don't have this tool you can uh just continue to use a punch but uh the reason we've gone with the oem optional stiffer springs is as long as you don't have as long as, as long as you're not looking to go extremely stiffer or extremely soft softer i always suggest going with the oem optional stiffer or optional softer springs on on bikes because they just fit the bike better. Uh, you know what you're getting. You know, since they are from the same manufacturer or supplier for them springs, that you know it is going to be two sizes stiffer for the stiffer one. They like I forgot the exact rate. But let's say this is a 5.5. It's going to be a 5.7. That's two sizes stiffer, and you know that that's what it's going to be. Where if you purchase a race tech spring, so to say, um, well. In my experience, sometimes they just don't, they, they either feel overly stiffer than what you expected or not as stiff. It's almost like their rates don't, are not always accurate. Um, I have spoken to suspension guys that have suspension dynos. Hold on, I'm moving too fast here. I'm not explaining to you what I did. Okay, did you see what I did? Let me put this back together. My bad, guys. All right. After I loosen this all the way up, then you slide the spring up and you and you slide this up. Now, if your bike's dirty, you might have to take a little hammer and kind of just tap that up. They get stuck on there after a while. But when you get that up, you'll see there's this clip right here. And you just remove that. That allows you to slide the spring off or the collar off first. And then the spring off. has a white mark right here most likely showing the rate of the spring but anyway i've spoken to, to suspension guys that have suspension dynos and uh, where um or should i say spring dynos where they can test the spring rate and have one guy told me that the uh race tech springs don't always match the, the rates that they're advertised at so what he has to do is buy multiple springs stick it on the spring dyno measure them and then mark what they are, put them on the shelf, and that way he knows, you know, if he has to bring a bike to two uh, sizes stiffer or softer, he actually knows exactly what rate that spring is because it's been on a dyno. Um, oh, they don't have a mark on this one. That's interesting. But anyway, uh, oh, oh, there it is right there. They usually, that these marks usually indicate what rate it is. If you, um, the manufacturer will have that information somewhere. Sometimes it's hard to find that information, but it's somewhere in the world. So, anyway, let's get this white one off the table. I don't want to accidentally install this one back on the bike. It can happen. And uh, it, it gets even more critical when you start dealing with the fork springs. Them suckers look identical, and they don't put a mark on them. So, all right, we got the spring off. Time to slide the new spring on. I remember that mark was on the bottom. So, most likely, because there's usually a top and a bottom with these. They'll fit a little tighter or looser on one end. Then the other, yeah, it's tighter on this end. So the, this, the end with the mark is the bottom end, and it's it's also uh, it's tighter right here. This is more opened up. But um, I have found personally, I uh, I like factory connection springs. If I have to go a crazy rate, stiffer or softer, and the OEM optional springs aren't going to cut it, um, I will just go with the factory connection springs. One thing I do like about factory connection springs, especially their fork springs, is they don't re, uh, race tech comes with shims, and the springs are shorter than stock, and, and you're supposed to shim it to match your stock spring. I guess the idea is, in case you want it to have more preload, you can just remove some shims, and that's all good. But I, I prefer stuff to be a little bit more plug and play. Uh, factory connection springs will come the exact same length as your OEM springs. And be quite honest with you, when I hold them side by side, I can't even tell a difference. It, I, I swear the, the texture is the same. The coil windings are the same. Everything about them is the same. I almost think they're from the same factory, as strange as that sounds. I, I, mean, I don't know, but just guessing. 
Their shock springs are the same way. Well, Race Tech shock springs will usually come with this little, little aluminum collar that you have to add to the shock spring. And I don't know. I just like the factory connection stuff better if I can't if 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 the OEM optional stuff is not an option for us. I'll just go with race, um, factory connection when I can. Anyway, let's get back to it. When you put this on, there is a top and a bottom. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. See that? That goes on the bottom. Interesting enough, I'm noticing this shock gives. Okay, no, that's not a. This is the groove right here. It looks like that top one right there would. It, it could be a second groove to put this clip in, but it's not nearly as deep as this one. So it's going to be the second one, obviously. There we go. All right. Now we just have to tighten her back down. Of course, the funner part of the job is when we get to the forks, as you can imagine. Now, we're still going to have to set the sag and all that. So, I'm not going to OCD how tight I put this spring on the bench. But I will say, uh, I typically just... I, get a, I generally have a good feel of what's close and uh you, i can tell by spinning it here what's close i'm gonna say that's close right there we're gonna leave it right there i'm gonna lock this down gently because there's no sense in cranking it down right now when we are definitely gonna have to set the sag i'm not gonna lock it down too tight but just tight enough where Someone did jump on the bike and ride it without setting it. It's not going to loosen up. But there we go. That is done. Time to get it on the bike. Okay. Time to slide it back on the bike. Gently lift the subframe back up and over. See if I can balance that frame there. Yes, I can. Slide that bolt in. Come on out. There we go. All right. Let me go ahead and kind of gently put the subframe somewhat back in place for a second here. See if I can rest it somehow, some way, so that it stays. Come on now. There we go. All right. Nut on. Now I'm not going to tighten the nut all the way yet. Um, there's always, I'll show you what I mean. There's always a little up and down play with these until you tighten them down, right? And you want to tighten it down on the compressed end. All right, let's get down to the bottom. To lift up the swing arm of the rear wheel again just a little bit get that to line up there we go oops there again i'm not going to tighten these up yet i'll show you why in a couple minutes all right let me remove my special tool 954 here again this is available on my online store fits perfectly look at that so before I tighten up the shock, I'm going to get the subframe back on in there. On there, That way, I don't have to worry about any of the wires. But remember, we have to hook up all this stuff again. You see, that's for the, the uh, air intake temperature sensor. You see why I had to unplug it? Because it really wouldn't have reached. And you don't want to risk breaking wires. And you can see right here, the vent hose, why I had to unplug that from the valve cover. And again, if your bike is the previous model CRF, these sensors are going to be in a different location. You're going to have things a little bit different, but it's, you know, about the same thing. You'll figure it out a little different, but you'll, you'll get the idea. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and start getting the subframe on. I'm going to take a little bit of WD-40, put it on my finger. I'm going to slide it 
I can put my other finger here. I'm going to slide inside this boot right here on the lip. That's going to allow it to slide on the throttle body just a little easier. That's going to help us uh, when it's time to slide that on. All right, here we go. I'll just tuck that in there for the time being. Let me go ahead and reconnect this sensor now. That air intake sensor. We had this clip right there. Okay, that's still there. Go over here where I can see the, the throttle body and the intake boot a little better. Okay. So it look, looks like it's about there. Let me get some hardware. Let me put the or at least one volt in. Actually, I'll put the one on the other side. So I'm just putting the top bolt in right now. So I'm going to lift the tank up and verify. Okay, it still has a little bit of room to go. Well, let me get you up in there and I'll show you. If you look in here, you'll see it's close, but not all the way on. See, see that little, um, yeah, let me get my finger up in here. See that little tab right there? I need to get that slid right over that little aluminum tab that's sticking up. So it's not on all the way, but I'll get it on. Just wanted to show you that so you know what I'm doing over here. this and kind of gently oh yeah there it goes went right on awesome let me show you see it's in there now get the light on it for you there it is so we have the throttle body or the throttle the intake boot all the way on the throttle body we're good there I'm gonna go ahead and tighten the Phillips for the clamp and then replace the uh, the other two subframe bolts. I'm going to pull these back out, put a dab of Loctite on them, put a dab of Loctite on the bottom ones, and replace them all. You want to use Loctite, these things can't vibrate loose while you're out riding. So let me do that. Okay, got the vent line connected to the valve cover. Um, I reconnected this little clip right here. Remember, I unclipped it from the air box. And as far as safety strap for the tank, I removed it because this is more of an idiot strap. And my, my friend Offney is not an idiot. I know when he wants to get his tank off, he just wants to get it up. This is more to keep the guy that's on aware from yanking it up too quick and ripping the wires. But as long as you're smart, I, I get rid of these on my own bike, so I assume he's going to want to. Okay, so we have the, uh, the hardware in for the shock, but we st still have the nut loose. Watch how much play this has in the rear. See that on camera there? And you can hear it too. All right. So if you tighten it up while it's on the stand, it's going to be at the bottom of that play, and it's just going to knock things off. It'll probably eventually work its way up to the top end of the play after you start jumping some big jumps. But it's definitely going to make your bike feel funny for a little bit until that happens. So what I'm going to do here is you can either put the bike on the ground, or you can just lift up on the rear wheel and tighten them up while you're holding the rear wheel up. I'm going to use the impact to get them tight a little bit, but i got it on setting number one. It's not going to strip them out. I'll, I'll tighten them by hand further when I'm done. So, see the play? Now, let me get the bottom. And that play should go away. See, look. No play. The play's gone. Now I'll tighten them up by hand. Like I said, I only had this impact on setting number one, so it's not going to strip anything out. It doesn't put much foot pounds down on setting number one. 
course there are torque specs for this if you want to follow that. I've been doing this for a lot of years so my hand is pretty calibrated. There we go. Okay, let me put this bike back together here and we'll get started on the forks. Let me go ahead and get the plastic back on, the seat on, and the muffler back on. Okay, since I have uh, pulled the whole subframe off and everything like that and had to deal with electrical wires and let me go ahead and start her up. I know it's a new bike. I don't want to really put any hours on the clock or any minutes on the clock because it's a new bike, but I do want to at least make sure it starts up and we don't have a check engine light flashing at us. Sweet. She's doing good. No check engine lights. And I didn't run her very long, so she still reads zero for Offney. That's good. Okay, time to do the forks. Let me start by getting the front wheel off. Okay. wheels off and out of our way yeah let me go ahead and get the caliper off of there and while I'm at it might as well remove the fork guards Get these off of there and out of the way. While the bike's here, he also is having me put a different set of triple clamps on it to have a different offset. So I'll be doing that too. The beauty of taking these off while it's on the bike while the forks are still on the bike is then we don't have to disconnect that. We can just leave all this hanging. One less thing to disconnect. We'll just take that off and set it off to the side just like that. Let it hang. I think I'm going to go and take the front number plate off too real quick. It'll give us a little more room when we're working.
I'll just leave that hung right there, like that. There we go. All right, I'm just going to take a measurement of where these forks are at. Well, I see they have a, a line right here. They have them on the stock line. But if you have it at a different setting, it doesn't hurt to take a measurement before you pull your forks off so you can put it right back to that. 4.78, I mean 4.87, which I'm going to say is basically 5 millimeters is what it is. And that's where we'll put it at when we're done. Okay. Careful in case it just falls. Yeah, it wants to fall. Okay, I'm gonna lower the fork just a little bit, enough to, be able to get the tool on. And I'm gonna tighten up only the one of the bottom clamp bolts here to keep the the, uh, the fork from spinning. The one special tool you will need for this job is a fork cap tool. This is a Tusk brand right here. But you could just either go to Rocky Mountain or eBay or Amazon or whatever, Google, and just type in um, fork tool for CRF 450 or 250 and plug in your ear. But all right, I'm going to pop this on up here. I'm loosening the cap on up while it is on the bike. I can't seem to get the tool on it with it right up there like that because it's hitting the, uh, the clamp for the handlebars. So what I'll do is I'll just loosen up the bottom again. Okay, I had to go a little bit lower even to be able to get the tool on. But now we can get the tool on there. The bottom bolt's tightened up to hold the fork from spinning. And it's still spinning a little bit, so let me go ahead and tighten it up a little bit more. I'll tighten it by hand though. Oh yeah, I didn't even really have it that tight. No wonder why. Okay, let's try it again. Holy cow, they put these things on tight stock. I don't want to bust my knuckles. And I don't want to scratch the bike. There we go. Great, drop my hammer. But that's nice and loose. Now I can remove this fork from the bike. And that fork is off. All right, I'm gonna do the exact same thing to the other fork and I'll see you at the bench in just a second. Okay, fork number one. We already have the cap loose, so make this part a lot easier. Oops. Pick up my tool. There we go. I'm, a, you know, this bike's never been ridden before, and I'm curious. Let's measure how much fluid they had in Brand new fluid, look at that. Now obviously you don't get all the fluid out. You know, it sticks in walls and little crevices and stuff. But let's get an idea where they had it at. I'm just going to sit here and let this drain and I'll be right back. I know firsthand that these forks call for 370 cc's of oil on the outer chamber cc's ml all the same thing so I'm just gonna see where it's at just curious I've had them sitting upside down with the lid on it for a few minutes let all that oil kind of drain to the bottom just trying to get it all out of there so we can get a good Reading. I think that's about all I'm going to be able to get out of there for the most part. So, okay. Let's see. Well, I'm finding this fork leg pretty much at 400 cc's, mls. 400. That's where it's at. If I find the other one at that, I'll probably just put it back to this. If I find it different, and then, you know, go from there. 
But yeah, it's one thing I have noticed what the manufacturer recommends for the bike and what you find um, when they're brand new. Sometimes two different things, it's just how it is. But yeah, so I'll just note that and continue on. All right, before I take this apart, I want to count where the clickers were at. I'm going to go clockwise and count the rebound, mainly just rebound. I'm not worried about compression. That's not going to change when we take it apart, but this will be affected when we take it apart. So let's see where it's at. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. They're at fourteen turns. Now I'm going to turn it all the way out. Um, if you're having a hard time feeling the clicks, just know every quarter turn is a click. So in a, a complete turn, there should be four clicks. We found this at fourteen. So when I'm done with the job, I'll just put it back to 14. But I will go ahead and unscrew it all the way out before I take it apart. Okay, it's going to be a 21 millimeter. I'm just going to slide the axle in right here. You can use a ratchet with a socket holding on the axle. I have an impact, so I'll be using that to take it apart. Crank up the strength in this one. Holy cow, they got that on tight, don't they? See if I got it down far enough. Yes, I do. Okay, I should be able to use a 14 millimeter wrench. I pushed this down. Yeah, there it is. Slide on the shaft with the 14, and that'll hold that in place. Now I'm gonna need a 17 millimeter wrench. Let me see if I can grab that real quick. There we go. You need to hold, have a 17 on that, holding that from spinning, and just loosen her. Again, you can use a ratchet. You don't have to use an impact. That's just what I'm using because I have it available to me. Push this back down. Slide the 14 back out. And now, all I have to do, let me slide this back a little bit so you can see what's going on here. Set that on the bench. We have the OEM spring here. We're going to lift it out. Lean that there. Set the OEM spring on the bench. I have not removed any of the new springs from the bag yet, so I don't get them confused. And before I go any further, because it's real easy to get confused, you know. I'll put a zip tie on the old spring that way if anything happens once I pull one of the new springs out let's say they all fall on the floor and get mixed up I'll know the one with the zip tie is the old spring don't because again they they usually don't put a marking on them yeah I'm not seeing any type of marking on them so there's no way identifying them visually at least okay brand new spring time cut it out the bag now, obviously, if your forks haven't been serviced in a while, now's a good time to go ahead and change out the inner chamber's fluid. The inner chamber is that piece right here. There is fluid in there, and that's what does your dampening. But this is a new bike. Um, it's got brand new fluid in it. There's no sense in it. Or if your bike has very, very low hours, or you recently serviced your suspension, you can swap out springs, no problem, without changing the inner fluid. Um, obviously, you're going to want to at least change the outer fluid because we had to dump it out. Sometimes you can get breeze in it and stuff. No sense in trying to reuse that. All right, before I go any further, see this right here? I'm going to bottom this out all the way down. There we go. Make sure you do that. Very important. And inside the here is a little rod. Make sure that stays in there. If you flip this upside down, that will come out. And when it comes out, there you go. you got to make sure it goes all the way back in. All right, slide the spring on. Pretty simple. Okay. Slide the fork body back on. I'm going to take the axle again. Put it in here. All right. Take my 14 millimeter, prop it there. 
Okay, you see that this has a, uh, there's a flat side to it right there. You need to match that up with that little rod I just showed you when you slide it on. There you go. And then twist it on. You'll hear it click. That's just the clicker spinning. It's okay. And for this part of the job, I will be using a uh, ratchet just to tighten it up. Scratch that. I'll be using a wrench. Put a four, I mean 17 back on here, holding that collar on that I just showed you that I've bottomed out. It's hard to do this. I'm holding three things at one time here, but there we go. Now I'll pull, yeah, all right. Pull down the fork again. Pull this 14 out. Now we can tighten that up. Okay. Of course, there are torque, torque specs for everything. I've been doing this a lot of years. My hands are calibrated. If you do it like this without a torque wrench, just make sure you get it pretty tight. Don't You don't want to strip it out, but you definitely want it pretty tight. Make sure I got it tight enough. That seems good. You saw how tight it was to get it off. And while I'm here, might as well set the clickers back to 14. So I'm going to turn it all the way clockwise until it bottoms out gently. You don't want to smash it down. Just gently bottom it out. Okay. And count 14, 14 clicks out. One, two, wait, hold on. All right. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Flip the fork back over here. Just going to tighten that up just a little bit by hand. There we go. Now all I need to do with this fork is add fluid to the outer chamber. But I'm not going to do that yet. I'm going to go ahead and change out the spring in the other fork. And then we'll add fluid to both the outer chambers at the same time. So this one's already done. Have the spring in this one. Let me set that aside so I don't get it mixed up here. Last thing I want to do is get it mixed up. There we go. Alright, I'm going to do this one off camera real quick. It's, it's the same exact steps as the one I just did. I'll be right back. Okay, both forks are done, but this is the, the other fork, the second fork. Look at that. I would say it's about 370 to 375. And... Um, Remember the first one I found it at, at 400. This one's about 370, 375. I'm just gonna put them both at that. Um, if you're curious, you can look in your manual, see what the level's at, or you can check racetech.com site. They usually have all the OEM levels right there. We're gonna put this at 470 because we can always add fluid real quick at the track if we feel it's too low by adding it to the bleeder here if we need to. But it's really hard to take extra fluid out because you'd have to take the forks off the bike and you know, yeah, it's easier to add. So let's go do it. There's fork number one. All right, let me go do fork number two. And fork number two. Now the the OEM fluid for these bikes recommended from Honda is SS19. We're using something a little different here. But if you want to use the OEM stuff, that's what you're going to want to purchase for it. I'll show you what that looks like. Right there, SS19 from Honda.
Okay, before I put these forks back on the bike, I need to swap out them triple clamps. So let me do that off camera real quick, and I'll be right back. Okay, if you remember when I was removing the forks, how I dropped them down about this low and tightened up only the bottom triple clamp bolt to hold them. That's what I'm doing again, so I can tighten the caps back up. Same thing. You don't have to go crazy tight with them. They got a rubber seal. It, it doesn't matter how tight they are, as long as you snug them down a little bit. The stock had them pretty crazy tight. I don't like to have them that tight because it's a pain in the butt to remove them. Just tight enough that they're not going to vibrate and loose or anything. It, like I said, they have a rubber O-ring that seals them. Plus, once you tighten this upper triple clamp, it squeezes on this fork tube. It keeps that cap from coming loose anyway. Okay. Let me go ahead and slide them up there to the uh, to the mark and tighten all the triple clamp bolts down. Okay, have these where I want them at five millimeters. Uh, these triple clamps right here, they mention right up here, 15 foot pounds. So I'm just going to use a torque wrench on this and put them 15 foot pounds. Reading. Let me go back down here and see if I can get some more. Yep, see how I can get more now on this bottom one? There you go, that's why you always go back and forth. Get more on the top one now. There you go, let me check the bottom one again. A little more, top one again. A little more, bottom one again. A little more, top one again. That's it, bottom one. That's it, there we go. Okay, moving along pretty quick here. Doing a lot of stuff off camera. Sorry about that. But, yeah. So I got the triple clamps torqued down. Oh, by the way, the bottom one, uh, somewhere around here, it says 12 foot-pounds for these ride engineer triple clamps. And the top one was, uh, I think, what was it? Uh, 15. Yeah. So I have that torqued down properly. Um, if you, if you want to follow torque specs and you have OEM clamps, make sure you look in the manual. They might be at a different torque setting. Um... Went ahead and got the fork guards on. I slid the front axle on with the tire. But I'm going to go down there and show you guys something. Most of you guys are probably already know this, but some don't. And it's really important getting that front them forks aligned on that axle. Let me show you what I mean. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is tighten up that nut on the other side right here. But I'm going to set the camera right here so you just watch the axle. Most of you guys already know this. As you go to tighten up, you might see the axle start spinning. See it spinning there so what we'll do what I do is I just tighten up just one for now we're gonna loosen that back up in a minute because we have to line the front end here but now I can tighten this up without it spinning of course there's torque specs to this but I've been doing this a long time I got a good feel for it there we go now what I'm gonna do is come back over here now that I have this nut nice and tight and torqued down I'm going to tighten these two 10 millimeters on this side, but leave it, I'm going to leave the other side loose. So I'm going to loosen that one in a second and leave them loose. All right. Back over here. Okay. In the old days, to get, well, first let me show you what I'm talking about here. Let me loosen this up. You see how there's a little bit of play right here? In and out play. When these are loose. This side right here, if I loosen it up, there will be no in and out play because it's pinched between this collar right here and this nut. So there will be no play. So there's nothing we can do here to align anything. But this side, we do need to align it because if this fork is in like that, then technically the, for, the, two, the two fork legs going all the way down are not parallel anymore. They're, they're, they're pinched then down at the bottom here. And when you jump a jump and you land or the suspension compresses and now it's tighter down here at the bottom, when it comes up to the top here, it's going to cause a bind, extra stiction and friction. It's going to wear out your bushings quicker and your fork seals will probably bust a leak pretty early in their life. Same thing if it was that way same thing is going to happen so you need to make sure that they're parallel and the best way to do that is to find the center point and now I got them nice and stuck here 
Let's see. Like, oh man, there we go. Okay, so you got to find the center point. Now in the old days, they would say loosen this side up, get on top of the bike, compress the grab the front brake, compress the rear end, and it will just fall into its position. That doesn't work nowadays. The bikes are a lot stiffer. You can't compress the suspension by pushing the front brake in and the front end down much more than three or four inches. Where in the old days, you could almost bottom the bike out. And that would that would align it back then. But this, today it won't. You can actually set it off alignment and go, get on top of the bike, hold the front brake, compress the front end, and you'll see it won't even move down here. So it's pointless. So what you do is you just find the center point. You'll see it's springy. When I push it in, see how it springs back out? And same thing when I pull it out, it wants to spring back in. You want to find the center point. Now, if your bike has a lot of stiction on here and a lot of friction, one thing you can do is loosen these up nice and loose. Take up. Now, it will leave a little mark here. Most Some people cry about that. I know the owner of this bike won't cry about it because he, he does this method too. Let me get a smaller screwdriver. I remember one of my other videos where I showed this technique. Guy's like, good thing I'm not buying your bike. Look at that mark you left on the fork. He, these are race bikes, man. Whatever it takes to get them right, this little stuff. Matter of fact, if I see this type of mark on a bike, that shows me that whoever was working on it went through the effort to make sure that this front end was really nicely aligned. Now, look how much easier it moves in and out. Now I can find the center point. It's springy. When you push it in, it comes out. You pull it out. Well, it usually wants to spring in, but it's getting a little stiction still. But I'm not going to knock that in anymore. So I need to find the center point. Now these have aftermarket triple clamps, so it's going to be different than what the stock would be. So I just kind of wiggle it back and forth. And I can feel the spring when I go in. It wants to pull it back out. When I pull it out, it kind of wants to go back in. And I just look for the center point. When I find that, I pull this out gently. And you can see it left a little mark there. But, I mean, you know, that's nothing. And again, these are race bikes. It's no different than when you see people drill a hole in their oil drain bolt to... Uh, to use safety wire to keep it from coming loose. You know, that's, these are some of the things we do to our race bikes sometimes to make sure that they are 100% on when we are on the track. And you see how I go back and forth as I'm tightening these up? Same thing with like the triple clamps. As you tighten one up, the other one will become a little bit looser. There. Now I know it looks odd that this uh, this front axle is inside of here a little bit, but that's what it takes to get these forks to be perfectly parallel. Remember, these are aftermarket triple clamps. Sometimes they can change that a little bit. And I can tell you, even stock, you'll find this front axle is in a little bit in here. Not quite as much as this, but a little bit. Um, when you have aftermarket triple clamps or aftermarket wheels, it can change that. Sometimes this axle will stick out a little bit. Sometimes it'll stick in a little bit, but as long as it's parallel, that's the most important thing. It's going to save your bushings and your seals. Lastly, you just got to bolt the, uh, oop, the front brake on. But I need, I need to get some Loctite on these bolts first. Let me see. This will pretty much complete the job. All right, let me slide it back on here again. I definitely make sure I use Loctite on these just like they did from the factory. You don't want these coming loose while you're out riding seen it happen to other people before and last but not least put on this wind catcher yes these things catch the wind that's why I try not to run for guards unless uh, unless it's like a muddy day or something if I'm gonna run them I typically don't but if I was run them it'd only be on muddy days because they do catch a little more wind up in the air hand guards too same thing Sometimes you need them, but you can do without them. They'll catch less wind. All right. Voila, finished finished product. And let me double check one more time. All good. Because remember, I had that whole front end apart all in wood. There's a lot of wires behind there. All right, she's good to go. Um, all we have to do is set the sag when he comes to pick up the bike, and then he'll go to the track and make adjustments. He's pretty good at adjusting his bike in, so he will uh, not only set it on the, you know, set it in the shop, but he'll also make adjustments at the track to find the perfect sag setting for him. Clickers, all that. Um, if you're into this type of suspension stuff, I do have a whole suspension series, a lot of long-winded videos on adjusting your suspension, but. I cover all this stuff if you're curious how to adjust your suspension in. 
Um, if you're not subscribed, it's free. You just click that. I appreciate all my subscribers. I hope all you guys have a great weekend of riding. Make sure you get out there and ride. That's pretty important. Just don't sit at home and do nothing this weekend. Go out and ride. Um, I'll be riding this weekend. Probably the 125, although I might take out the 250. I'm not really sure yet. And I'm not really sure where I'm going to ride yet. It might be Moto Bros Punta Gorda, or it could be MX-74. Still kind of up in the air, but it's going to be on Saturday. Anyway, appreciate you guys watching this, and catch you next time.